What's up, Gear Mortals? Trey Xavier here. Today, I want to talk to you about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is writing better and more interesting metal bass lines. Metal is a genre that typically doesn't have very interesting or cool bass lines. There are many, many exceptions to this rule. There are a lot of great bass players in metal, but there are so, so many bands out there where the bass essentially just doubles the rhythm guitar, an octave down, and that's it. And really, I think we deserve better. So I'm here to help you make your metal bass lines way better in every way and more interesting to listen to. I've got this here, Ray 34 from Sterling by Music Man. Uh, it's a Stingray bass. As you can see, it is real sick. This is what I'm gonna be playing today. So I've got this song here. It's pretty heavy. It's a little weird. Um, I wrote it for this random drum grooves songwriting thing that we do. So it's a little all over the map, but I think it's a cool challenge because what we've got is something that's pretty busy, which means that adding too much to the bass could make it sound really chaotic and overly busy. But at the same time, I think I can definitely jazz up some of these parts a little bit. So let's take a listen to the first riff here. So there's kind of a lot going on there. It's a bit of a thrashy power metal sort of a thing. I'm tuned down a whole step, but I'm gonna say all the note names as if we're in standard tuning. So we're in the key of A flat. So that's kind of what the guitars are doing. That in and of itself is a little bit busy. Obviously I could easily just double the guitar part down an octave and that will reinforce the part. It'll make it feel better. It'll fill out the low end. It doesn't add anything musically to it though, but that's where we're gonna start as a starting point and build from there. So here's what that would sound like. Sounds good, sounds fine. There's nothing wrong with that exactly, but there's a couple spots where we could for sure spruce it up a little bit. The thing about the bass, and please don't tell bass players this because really we don't need their egos running any more muck, is that they have a ton of power over how the song sounds. The bass defines the chord that you're hearing. The lowest note that you hear in a song at any given moment is gonna define the chord as you're hearing it vertically. Not just the chord as it's being played on an instrument, but all the notes straight up and down, the bass, the guitar, keyboards, the note that the singer is singing, all of those added up together are gonna make a chord, and the root of it is going to always sound like whatever the lowest note is, and that's typically the bass. So if I was my pal Glenn Fricker, I would probably be saying something like, well, who, whose bright idea was it to give them all the power? And then I would yell. But of course, with great power comes great responsibility, and I think your main responsibility when you're the bass player is to very strongly consider what's going on in the rest of the song, the other parts that you're hearing, uh, so that you can be sure to be playing the appropriate note. So, the first sort of wild card moment in this riff is the spot where uh, the guitars aren't playing a chord, they're playing a little lead thing, and sort of it sort of pulls the rug out from under you, and that gives me an opportunity to spruce it up a little bit. So let's take a look. Right there. So I just played, and the guitars are going. The rhythm guitars prior to that are playing this chord. So if I were to just continue that, that sounds fine. If I wanted to fill out the chord a little bit, I could do sort of a walking bass line. Now a walking bass line is something that we get from blues and jazz and like Latin music. It 
It's sort of a glorified arpeggiation of the chords. There's a, a whole rich history, culture, tradition of walking bass lines, and we're not gonna worry about that too much, but I'll give you just the basic gist of what you're gonna do with a walking bass line. First of all, you have to know what the chord is that you're arpeggiating. In this case, like I said, we are in the key of A flat minor. That makes this a G flat dominant seven chord. If I were to just arpeggiate that chord, or just as a triad, that's what we get. You can also do it like that. The two most popular walking bass lines are starting at the root. You go root, second, third, fifth, or root, seventh, sixth, fifth of whatever chord you're in. For example, if it's a minor chord, you're gonna go one, two, flat, three, five. Like I said, in this case, we have a dominant seventh chord, root, major third, fifth, flat seventh. There's not a whole hell of a lot of time for me to fill out that chord, but I could do something like, or, I could arpeggiate the chord very quickly, or I could hold out something a little bit longer, like. The simplest and easiest thing you can do to just about any chord is to play the root and then play the fifth. So if you don't know any music theory at all, the fifth is just like a power chord on the guitar. You just go, if you're in standard tuning or some variation of standard tuning, you go up one string and up two frets. There's the fifth. Some chords have a flatted fifth. Okay, let's try that first. Let's see what happens if we do that first. Nothing wrong with that. That sounds great, fills it out a little bit. Let's try something a little more complicated. So either way, we still get the feeling of those lead notes being over this root. We get the feeling of this chord. In the key of A flat minor, G flat is the seven chord. So now if I play the whole thing all together. That fills it out. It's a little busy, but it doesn't really feel that busy. It doesn't add to the chaos, I don't think. It doesn't feel chaotic. I could do something really wild and try and double up what the guitar is doing. That would probably be really crazy. Well, if you're feeling shreddy. <laughs> you might be better than me and maybe you could nail that. I don't think that sounds that cool. I like something that really fills out the harmony and supports what's going on harmonically rather than something really shreddy and impressive, which is cool and can be really fun but uh, generally I don't wanna take that home with me at night. All right, coming up, we've got another, what I like to call wild card moments, and that's where usually if there's some sort of extended chord, something uh, that, that sustains and gives you a little room to do something cool. So we've got this sustaining B note, which is a B major chord, 100% of the time, an octave is a safe bet. Because it's the same note. Uh, this is a B, this is a B. So if a B works, a B works 100% of the time. It's usually kind of like a rhythmic device. It sort of just gives you something else to go to rhythmically so that you're not stuck on a single note. So let's try just sneaking in an octave there and see what happens.
So that's cool. It's, of course, a very safe bet. It doesn't add any harmonic information at all. It doesn't fill out the chord. We don't know what other notes are in the chord from the bass line alone. So if we want to add a little bit of, a little bit more flavor to it, we could add notes such as the third or the fifth. Almost never do you want to play the fourth of the chord on the bass. Once again, if you don't know any theory at all, a fourth is the distance in standard tuning between two strings on the same fret. So if this is the root of the chord, you don't want to hang out on this note. What we can do is walk right past it. So if we do... That's kosher as far as I'm concerned. Let's try that. I think that works pretty well. You could be even a little bit less straightforward with the rhythm, give it a little bit more flair. You gotta think of it like this. Any note that's a chord tone is for sure fair game. That means you have to know what the chord tones are, which just, those are just the notes that exist in the chord that is either played or implied, depending on the key you're in. Um, that's a little bit of theory stuff you'd have to know. If you know major and minor chords, that'll take you very, very far. You know, for example, here's a major triad. Root, major third, fifth, octave. If we take this note, the third, and we flatten it, or flat it, then we get root, minor third, fifth, octave. And then if we take this minor third and play it here instead, it's much easier. You can get away with just the root and the fifth and the octave if you like. Um, and then maybe every once in a while, if you're feeling adventurous, throw in that third. But I find that for metal, to really define the chord, generally, most of the time, you're gonna wanna start on the root and go from there. Yeah, I like that. That's got some flair. It doesn't feel like a, just a straight up arpeggio. Varying the rhythm like that gives it a lot of personality. It makes it its own thing and sort of separates it out from the guitars enough without completely abandoning the sound that you're going for. All right, so here's this whole riff. Cool, let's check out the next part. Right here, the guitars are, the rhythm guitar is playing this. And then the lead guitars are playing like a cool little counterpoint thing. I kind of feel like I want to change the very last note. I feel like that would maybe lead in better a little bit to the next thing. So that means that the guitars are now landing on the fifth. If I change the last chord to this, we wind up with this. I've now changed the, the final chord to a B major. Actually, I might even want to simplify it a little bit further. Sometimes playing fewer notes fills it out even more. If you let the other instruments do the walking and you stick around on a root note. So the guitars are playing some kind of uh, complicated stuff. If we keep the bass really simple, it'll actually sound a little bit fuller. Check it out. I could even add a third chord in there if I wanted. Sounds pretty good. Now I'm just gonna hit it like I mean it. Something that I do fairly often in recording bass guitar in metal is a lot of slides. Something about that just feels really awesome in a mix. 
um, and it really leads into the next part. That's something that I definitely could have done right here, especially considering that there's this big pick scrape. Let's see what that sounds like. It doesn't have any harmonic value, really. It's, it's just a, a kind of a party trick. That's a bunch of things we could have done just in that little tiny space of one riff. Let's move on to the next one and see what, see what we got going on here. This riff has a lot of space. Here's what it sounds like if I just follow the guitar. Sounds fine, sounds cool, nothing really inherently wrong with that. But once again, we have so much room for activities. So let's see if we can do some of those activities in a way that doesn't interfere with the song, isn't distracting. Like I said, I like to start with just doubling the guitar as, a, as just a starting point and then build on it from there. I do, however, really enjoy melodic bass parts sometimes, especially if the riff is just one note like it is for the first part of this. I like to add melodic fills uh, and melodic bits to it to ornament. <laughs> Well, I pulled the string off <laughs> the fretboard at the end, but you get the idea. Really, I just added two note fills in between certain parts. And that fills it out a little bit. You might want to think of it compositionally in like the sense that the first time the riff comes around, you just play it bare bones, you, you play it exactly the same as the guitar, and then the second time the riff comes around, you add in a little bit of frills, which creates a nice surprise and, uh, and builds the song a little bit. I look at it like this. Anytime there's chords happening, the bass player can usually do something to make it more clear what the chords are that are happening. And playing just the root helps with that, but you can help even more. So the rhythm guitar is playing like a... one of these kinds of things. Usually when that happens, I find that this kind of a chord on, on the guitar, this like uh, minor sixth power chord, that usually implies an inverted uh, chord. So I usually think of this as the root. So what you can do, you can actually play, because it's doing you could fill it out by going or you could just hang out on this note and let the guitar do that part. So if this is the root, I can play that an octave lower and fill it out like that. Yeah. Like I said, octaves always safe. I feel like at the end of a riff like this, Giving her a little bit of that sounds pretty good. Another cool thing that you can do is lead into the next part either by doing a little walk up or a little walk down, a little ascending or descending run from the part you're at into the part you're going into. So we've just done. And we're, get, we're going here from here and then you just do a little run in the scale that you're in, whatever key you're in. It's okay to not know exactly. Um, a little bit of trial and error never hurt anybody. Try it, and if it sounds good, great. If it sounds wrong, adjust a note or two and just keep going until you have something that sounds good. So I'm gonna try it like this.
So that gives you a, a little walk into the next part. It sort of anticipates the next thing that's coming. It sort of picks the listener up and drops them off at their destination instead of this very abrupt motion from one thing to the next. I tend to find that the lower a riff is on the guitar, the more likely I am to double it up on the bass exactly. Because if a guitar part is a, is a little bit higher up, if it's sort of in the, the middle range of the guitar or higher, you can get away with a lot more on the bass, I think. If it's really low and you're trying to do too much on the bass, what you wind up with is a lot of mud. There's something called low interval limits, and that is that the lower that you go, certain intervals just start to sound really muddy and indistinct, and you, it, do, it doesn't matter if it's theoretically correct, um, you, just, you just won't hear the interval that you're going for. So this next thing that's gonna happen is in a good place where I think I could, even though it's kind of a busy riff, I think I could do something different lower down that will fill it out a bit. So basically what we've got here is a riff that implies a five chord in a minor key using the fifth mode of harmonic minor, also known as Phrygian dominant. So that leads us back to where we started on this note. So basically what we're hearing is Basically we're implying this kind of a chord. It's a dominant seven flat nine, which sort of implies that we are on a five chord in a major key. Basically that pulls, pulls us back to this A flat minor. So here's what it would sound like if I play it exactly the same as the guitar. Once again, nothing particularly wrong with that. You kind of hear where it's going, but I feel like the the motion could be a lot stronger. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna play with that a little bit. I'm gonna try to really imply this chord very strongly. The main thing is just that I don't want to land on this third. It's cool for the guitars to do that, but I want to land on the on the root of the chord so that it really pulls us back to this other chord that we're going for. So by not really going too far from this one root note, I just added in a couple fifths. What happens is we've really, really strongly established what the actual chord is that's being implied here whereas before it was basically implied but a little loosey-goosey. Now there's just, there's no way that you could interpret it any other way other than hearing it as this chord. So then the next riff is basically the same as the first one. Uh, with a, a little bit of a twist. What I want to do with the ending of this part is demonstrate another cool thing that I really like to do, which is called contrary motion. So, if you have any two musical lines, they can only do a certain number of kinds of motion when you go from one note to the next. They can do contrary motion, in which they go in different directions. They can do similar motion, where they go in the same direction, either up or down. They could do something called oblique motion, where one of them stays the same and the other one moves in one direction or the other. So in this part of the song, we've got the guitars already doing a little bit of a contrary motion thing, um, but it's, it's kind of slow. It's a ba -na -na -na. So we're gonna kind of go double time contrary motion. This is sort of a fancy advanced move, but basically we're gonna go down the scale and then we're gonna go back up and down it again from a different point. And then land on that B like we did the first time. Let's see if I can play it. That 
That sounds pretty cool to me. It's once again, busy, but not bonkers. And if you pick your notes right, you can get away with playing a lot more busily than you would think. And then when we arrive at that B, we could fill it out as well if we like. I think the biggest takeaway for you as a bass player should be that even though we consider the bass as being a single note at a time instrument, we still have to think chordally. We have to think vertically. What is the chord that's expressed or implied? The chord that's actually being played or is implied in the sense that each note of the chord is being played by different instruments at any given moment. And we can use that knowledge to our advantage when building our bass lines because even though it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna play like a chord, you might, I've seen a lot of bass players do it really well. In metal, that doesn't really work that well. So in general, we're doing some kind of modified arpeggios most of the time if we wanna jazz up what we're doing. So if you're trying to get away from just railing on those root notes, as I'm sure you probably have done quite a bit of if you play bass in a metal band. Really knowing what chord is happening at any given moment, knowing what the chord tones are in there, and playing these sort of modified arpeggios or walking bass patterns can really get you a long, long way towards making more interesting, better sounding bass guitar parts that will really fill out and add to the harmony and just reinforce everything that's happening in the song at any given moment. This will allow you to really reinforce what's going on in the rest of the song. Everyone is gonna be happy about this. Um, you get to do something that's more exciting than just following the rhythm guitar part. Everybody in the band is gonna think that you're a genius and the audience will hear much more clearly what the chord changes are that are happening in the song and uh, that just makes for better songwriting. So it's a win, 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 win. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you learned something today that you can apply to your metal bass lines. If you haven't already, mash that subscribe button and smack the bell for more reviews and original content, and I'll see you real soon.